you look into your pet's eyes, what do you see? A reflection of yourself? A glimpse into a world untamed by human expectations? Or perhaps just a creature sharing the same space, navigating this chaotic world alongside you? Welcome to the Companions Collective, where we dig into the human-animal bond and uncover the messy, beautiful reality of it all. I'm Angela Schneider, your guide through the depths of our shared connection with our companion animals. Join me as we explore the tangled web of love, loss, and everything in between that defines our relationships with the creatures who know us best. Dog crates can be um, not the most attractive piece of furniture in your home, but some people find them quite useful in training and containing their dogs. So why not have a crate that becomes a part of your decor? That's where Danny Nathan comes in. He's the founder and CEO of Apollo 21, a company that sits at the intersection of a business consultancy, a product design studio, and a venture studio. Essentially, Danny designs cool shit, like a sleep platform to overland in his SUV, and more recently, dog crates. But you don't just buy the crate. Oh no, my friends. Danny designs cool shit, then creates design manuals so you can do it yourself. I think it sounds like fun, but let's let Danny fill us in. Good morning, Danny. How are you today? I'm good, thanks. How are you doing? I am awesome. Thank you. Um, why don't we get started with you telling us who you are and what you do? Sure. Uh, my name is Danny, as mm -hmm. we covered. Uh, by day, I run a innovation and product design studio that helps companies build digital products. And in my spare time, I have an entrepreneurial bent that I just have trouble turning off. And so that leads to all kinds of fun little side projects and side businesses like Stay Good Dog, which is the uh, business through which we have created a DIY manual to help people build an amazing, beautiful custom dog crate that hopefully looks better in their home than some metal jail cell like we're all used to. That sounds pretty cool. Creators got to create, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> what drew you to dog crates? <laughs> uh, so Stay Good Dog is actually the second company that I've uh, started that is focused on helping people build things. And so the first was uh, basically helping people design storage systems for their off-road SUVs. And I, again, I bought an SUV and my wife and I were getting into camping and decided that we needed some additional storage. And so uh, instead of just being satisfied with building it once, I decided to make a business out of it. And so we've been running that for about three years. And um, I was just sort of looking around one day and thinking about how I could take the skills that we have created through that company and reapply them to something else that might be fun and interesting. And um, we had we had noticed, I guess, a year or two ago that there's a number of companies coming out with really nice looking like bent wood dog crates and things like that. And we got really excited because, as I noted, we're tired of having a metal jail cell in the corner for uh, for our pup Ernest. And so we started looking into those and to make a long story short, realized that they were obscenely expensive. Mm. And so uh, that was when kind of the two things clicked for me. And I said, gee, you know, I bet we could take the uh, the skills that we learned creating off-road SUV uh, storage systems and reapply the same materials and the same thinking to helping people build an awesome dog crate. And so... I built out a prototype and kind of worked out all the kinks. And then I built another one and created our build manual, which guides people through every single step of the process. And now we have Stay Good Dog. Ah, oh, very nice. I think I just saw Ernest trot behind you. Yes, he just went bolting by. <laughs> Tell me about Ernest. Uh, Ernest is a 10 and a half year old Basenji who we've had since he was a puppy. And uh, he is all things that a typical Basenji are for the most part, although he's a little bit more social than a lot of them. Um, and so 
he's been a handful, you know, ever since we got him. And uh, he's been a, uh, a joy and a menace and a terror and all of the fun things that you expect from a Basenji um, and is remarkably uh, mischievous and manipulative and smart and all of those wonderful things. They complicate our lives, but in so many good ways. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> so what was it about? Ernest that made you go, he needs a crate. Uh, so Ernest is the first dog that my wife and I have had together. We've both had dogs growing up, but um, we were looking, you know, we were trying to figure out what kind of dog we wanted and uh, had originally planned on rescuing when we were living here in New York, which is a shockingly difficult process. Mm. Um, there are so many rescue orgs and things here in the city that will not allow you to rescue a dog if you don't have a yard, for example, which is really hard to find in New York. Oh. Um, and so ultimately we ended up uh, not rescuing because of that and started looking into other breeds that we might, you know, might fit our lifestyle. And uh, we like, you know, unique, weird, random things. And Basenji certainly at the time 10 years ago were a pretty lesser known breed and uh, had lots of qualities that, that we were looking for. They're quiet, they're clean, they're fastidious, they're supposed to be light on the shedding and hypoallergenic, although we have found that that is highly untrue. <laughs> Ernest sheds <laughs> everywhere. Um, and I so that. when I love we... that word supposed to be, it always yes. puts us in trouble. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Supposed to be. Um, and so we went and we met a few other Basenji owners and things like that. And one of the pieces of advice that just continually came up when we first got Ernest was start crate training early. And okay. so, you know, the Basenjis are known for being escape artists and not particularly liking to stay put in a crate. And so uh, we had just sort of steeled ourselves for a lifetime of, you know, escaping and difficulty with keeping him in a spot. And uh, fortunately, it has turned out that Ernest loves his crate. And I guess of all of the things that we did as first time pet owners and first time Basenji owners, that was one that we managed to nail pretty well was the crate <laughs> training. And so um, it's really just been a, a major boon for us in terms of having a place where we know that he's safe and comfortable if we need to leave him at home for a little while or um, just having a place where he can go and curl up and sort of uh, as I call it, have his fortress of solitude. Mm, so um, there are pros and cons to uh, crate training. Have you dug into any of that at all? Uh, we've dug in a bit. Um, you know, I'll be frank, our experience started off with Ernest will be crate trained. And so it was never really a question for us. And, you know, we didn't spend as much time dwelling on the cons as we did on, you know, yeah. focusing on the pros and making sure that we, uh, we sort of nailed it out of the gate. And, um, you know, early on, one of the hardest things about crate training is just those first kind of, I don't know, few nights or a few weeks, depending on how well it goes, where your pup's sitting there crying all night, and you have to just sort of you know, ignore it and learn that uh, that they will get past it. And so, again, fortunately for us, Ernest in about about a week got very used to being in a crate, and that was it. It was just sort of his safe space from that moment forward. It's interesting to me that uh, crate training is illegal in Sweden and Finland. It's actually considered. I was not aware of that. Yeah, it's it's considered animal abuse there. Um, ooh, darn it. Um, what do you see are the are the top benefits for uh, Ernest in particular? Uh, for Ernest, like I said, it gives him a safe space that he knows is his. It gives him somewhere to sort of uh, retire or relax to when, you know, he's overwhelmed or when he just needs some time to himself. And perhaps more importantly, it gives us the confidence that we can leave him uh, home alone and know that there won't be any destructive tendencies or anything like that. He won't be chewing on furniture. He won't be scratching at doors. And I mean, I've seen stories where dogs in general and Basenjis in particular have literally chewed their way through doors and things like that to get, you know, out of rooms. And so for us, the biggest benefit is knowing that we don't need to worry about that. We don't need to worry about him getting hurt or damaging anything, anything like that when we do need to leave him. So tell me about that first crate that you used then. 
I, our first crate was your classic folding metal, you know, 40 bucks on Amazon type of thing with one of the little dividers that you could move. Uh, of course, when he was small, you know, the crate was a bit too big for him. And so he had about, I guess, about two thirds of it. And um, lucky for us, you know, he never never really showed much tendency to try and escape or anything like that. Um, I think when he was a puppy, we had the crate and then we had a little puppy playpen kind of around the front end so that he could come out of the crate and wander around a little bit. Um, and as I said, lucky for us, he just never displayed the tendency that a lot of Basenjis do of like climbing up the, the walls of the playpen or anything like that. And so uh, he ended up being remarkably easy in that regard. <laughs> he's preparing you for your next one who's gonna yeah. be error <laughs> yeah it'll be a 180 for the next one i'm sure <laughs> so i get what you're saying i think in that you just have this ugly metal cage sitting in the corner of your room and yep. you know you want to have people over and all of a sudden it's like yeah there's a it's not exactly beautiful home decor Right. right. And it's I mean, it's fine. You know, as a dog owner, it's just one of those things that you learn to put up with. And, you know, eventually I, I will say we, we didn't really care that much about the crate. Um, but when we saw the opportunity to do something about it, it kind of piqued our interest. And that's when we saw just how expensive some of the uh, the prettier alternatives can be. And um, I think in the size that we wanted for Ernest, the ones that we were seeing ran like seven to eight hundred dollars a pop and oh my. we just yeah we just couldn't fathom spending that on a dog crate especially when it was replacing something that was you know 35 dollars or something like that and was perfectly functional you know other than the fact that it just doesn't look real nice there's nothing wrong with your standard black crate yeah um so was the aesthetic the chief inspiration behind designing your crate um for the most part, you know, as I said, like a, a regular kind of folding metal crate is functional. It's fine. Mm -hmm. It does the job. It's, you know, there is nothing wrong with it whatsoever. But if you're looking for something that looks a little bit better in your home or that, you know, if if you're in a place like New York, like we are, where, you know, everything is out in the open, there's no there's no spare little room to tuck a crate in or anything like that. Um, everything is just where people can see it or where we can see it. And so, um yeah, I think that the aesthetics were really kind of the driving factor behind us experimenting with creating our own and figuring out how to fit it in the space. And the other big benefit, especially with our crate, which is, you know, custom to whatever size the creator wants, is that it allows you the flexibility to tuck it into random corners and uh, really fit it into your space with a little bit more care and execution. So uh, as an example, we have uh, a set of built-in bookshelves in the corner of our apartment that happened to have a spot underneath it that was just about the perfect size for Ernest's crate. And so when we built our own, we designed it explicitly to fit into that little nook so that it could be tucked away a little bit. And Ernest in particular really likes having a den-like space. And so he he seems to enjoy kind of hiding out in places that are kind of enclosed and feel like a... Um, you know, like a little cave or a little den that he can make his own. That's pretty cool, especially considering you live in an apartment in New York. You have to make every ounce of sp every inch of space yes. functional, right? Yes, exactly. Not like a three bedroom home in the suburbs of Washington. <laughs> yeah, when I was growing up, you know, we had a we had a reasonably sized laundry room where the dog's crate fit and it was out of the way. And, you know, unless you were in there doing laundry, it was never really much of a bother. And so I don't think that the thought at that time would have ever crossed our minds that we needed something that wasn't a standard metal crate. And, you know. Now that we live somewhere in a much smaller space and don't have the luxury of having that extra nook or room or whatever to give Ernest his own bedroom, uh, it becomes that much more important to us. So I actually buy a manual from you, not materials or a crate. Correct. Correct. So what we have created is a very, very robust how-to manual that walks people through 
literally every single step of the process from deciding on what size crate you need to figuring out what uh, the finish might look like and helping you decide on what materials are best for you. We give you links to order everything. It's very easy. We have carts that are all set up. You uh, you click a button and make a couple of adjustments to the lengths of some of the, the pieces that make up the crate. And we've actually built a handy little calculator that helps people figure that out. So all you have to do is determine what the final size of your crate will be, plug those measurements in, and we spit out everything for you in terms of the size of the plywood panels that you'll need and the size of the metal extrusion beams that we use for the frame, et cetera, et cetera. And then we literally guide you step by step with words and photographs of every single thing that you need to do to put the thing together once you get all of the parts. And we help you with the decision making on what kind of finish you should use, whether you want to paint it or keep it bare wood, uh, anything like that. And then, uh, yeah, like I said, we walk you through the whole deal. Well, that's pretty cool because we kind of live in a do-it-yourself world since COVID, don't we? Yeah. And I, you know, it's funny that was, it was during COVID that I started the other company where we were creating the SUV uh, platforms. And so this is very much born out of my sort of need for some sort of DIY project during COVID. And now, you know, post COVID, I've just sort of gotten hooked on, huh, I wonder if I could make a, yep, yep, I can do that. Cool. Uh huh. Yeah, we're, we're very resourceful when we need to be, aren't we? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, um, it, 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 can I get a shop if like, if I wanted to go to Home Depot, just the local Home Depot, is that possible too? Or is, uh, There are some of the materials and tools that you can get at Home Depot, and we, we help document all of that. Um, the frame of our crate is made out of a material called aluminum extrusion, which I kind of liken to um, like an erector set for adults. Mm -hmm. And that is something that is a little bit more specialized. It's not something that you'll find at your, you know, your everyday Home Depot store, but there are a number of online retailers and we have one that we've worked with for years now that uh, has been great in terms of service and they have the best pricing that we have found on aluminum extrusion parts. And so in the build manual, uh, as I said, there's literally one click links to getting the extrusion parts and it's it's a big bundle uh, that we've kind of mapped out and everything. So it has every part that you need already laid out in it. And uh, you can choose between silver and black aluminum extrusion and we've already set it up. So um, we make recommendations on the thickness of the plywood that you might use for the uh, the walls and doors. And based on your decision there, we have different carts all set up. So uh, in spite of the fact that you can't go to your local home Depot and get the extrusion parts, we've made it as easy as we possibly can to to get them. And they just kind of show up at your doorstep all pre-cut. So your your manual costs $50. And then what are we looking at? Obviously, depending on dog size, what are we looking at in materials? Right. It it does depend highly on the size of the dog and therefore the size of the crate. Um, generally, what we were aiming for was to achieve roughly half of the price that we were seeing for some of the more expensive crates. So um, as I said, I think Ernest's crate from one of the, the high-end crate builders would have run seven or $800. And our crate build for Ernest came in right around the $300 mark. Okay. And that includes buying some of the tools, all of the materials, things like that. So it's a little higher or lower depending on, you know, what you have access to in your toolkit already. But um, for the most part, it is it is definitely cheaper than, you know, having somebody build you a high-end dog crate. Have you tested it against one of the more destructive breeds, like, I don't know, a husky? I, we have not explicitly tested it. Ernest has managed to chew on his crate a little bit, um, being that the, the walls of the crate are made of plywood. And so there are benefits and drawbacks to that. If your dog chews on the crate, it will get damaged a little bit. On the other side, um, it is made of plywood, which you can get at your local Home Depot. And so if you get a panel that is damaged beyond repair, then it's very easy to replace it and doesn't cost a whole lot. It takes, you know, a couple hours of work to sort of prep the panel and get it reinstalled. But you'll already know how to do it if you've been through the manual and built the original crate. And so it makes it very easy to to kind of pick and choose and, and rebuild the crate as needed. Um, that being said, if you're... If you have a dog that is a known chewer, it may not be the best option for you. <laughs> Go for those calm breeds. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, 
what kind of advice can you give to people who are thinking about crate training and looking at what you offer and um, thinking about moving forward? Uh, there's a few things that come to mind there. One, if you're just getting started, if you have a, either a puppy or a dog that is new to you that you've rescued or something, and you're working on crate training, uh, don't start with one of our crates because during that training period, that's when your dog will likely, you know, scratch at the crate a bit, try and chew its way out, things like that. Um, and so start with something that's cheaper. If you need to pick up one used off of Facebook marketplace or something like that, just to kind of get over the hump of the initial training. The other piece of advice that I'll offer is um, the hardest part in my mind about crate training is sort of preparing yourself for it uh, as opposed to preparing your dog. You know, uh, there's, there's tons of advice about how to crate train your dog. I won't get too heavily into that, but treats are your friend when it comes to it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the biggest advice is, know that there are benefits to crate training. And if it's something that you believe that you want to do, just be aware that you're going to have, you know, anywhere from a few nights to a few weeks of crying pup that you're going to have to learn to ignore, which is one of the hardest things. Um, but as I said, the outcome and the, you know, the benefit of it is that by the time you're done, you will have a, a dog that knows that it has a very safe space that is its own. And we have found that to be remarkably helpful. And a real sense of accomplishment from building your own dang crate too, like a key. Yes, when it comes to the building aspect, absolutely, and that's one of that's one of my favorite things about it is you know you get to you get to look at something that you know now lives in the corner or wherever it is and say oh yeah I built that and I know how to do it and you know if I want to change it or change the color or try it again and change it up a bit like you know how to do it and to me that's invaluable. How am I crating? And especially your crate, improve the animal-human connection? Ooh, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think that, I think there's a couple of ways. You know, one, the pride of having built something yourself and knowing that you have built it for your dog, uh, to me, is one of the most fun parts about our crate. And, you know, it's silly. Your dog's not going to sit there and go, oh, no, no, I want purple and not green for the walls. But at the same time, every dog has a personality. And there are things that you can do, especially when you're building your own crate, to sort of match that living space to your dog's personality as well as to your home decor and things like that. And so uh, to me, that's one of the biggest benefits of it. And then, of course, you know, feeling like you have done something for your dog that, um, enhances their quality of life and that uh, helps them feel more at home in your space, um, at least for me as a dog owner, gives me a lot of pride and makes me feel good because I know that in this case, Ernest is is more comfortable and happier and feels like he's got, you know, his own space. I'm out of questions. Is there anything else you'd like to add? <laughs> um I guess the thing that I will add is, you know, our, our build manual is quite extensive and uh, it comes in at about 185 pages. And it is it is not the first manual that I have written. I've taken great care to ensure that every single detail is covered. And so, um, you know, to me, some folks might look at it and go, oh, my God, 185 pages. That's that's a lot to get through. And in reality, um, you know, every page is one sentence with a couple of carefully photographed images showing you exactly what you need to do, which ends up creating pages. It takes, you know, it takes up a lot of space to to document everything as carefully as we have. And so my biggest kind of advice there is don't be overwhelmed by the idea of creating something for yourself. Um, we've made it as easy as we possibly can. And so um, it's really not a terribly difficult process in spite of the fact that it's a lengthy uh, description or, you know, outline of of how to get through it. I just thought of one more question. How long should it take? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. So um, generally, the actual time building is probably two to three days. It's a it's a solid weekend, maybe, you know, a little bit into into the evenings, uh, the week upcoming. But the process overall will end up taking by the t from the time you buy the manual to the time you have a finished crate, you're probably looking at call it three to four weeks because it will take 
usually a week or two for the materials to get to you. And that's after you've figured out exactly, you know, what size you want your crate to be and things like that. And then of course, depending on how you choose to finish your crate, there is drying time between paint coats and all of that fun stuff. Um, so the active work time is not overwhelming, but the entire process does take a little while. Do you recommend having a beer while you're working on it or waiting until after? It depends highly on what step you're on. Uh, if you're on one of the steps that requires a saw or a drill, then I would advise you to hold off on the beer. Okay. If you're on one of the steps that primarily requires a wrench and, you know, a screwdriver, then by all means, the beer will help it go faster. <laughs> Danny, where in the world do we find you? <laughs> so uh, the best place to find us is on our website. We are staygooddog.com. And of course, we're active on socials, primarily on Instagram right now and kind of working our way into the other social media uh, platforms and things like that. Um, and if uh, folks are listening, if you're one of our first 100 customers, we are offering 50% off the build manual. And that is with code launch dash L-A-U-N-C-H-D-A-S-H. Awesome. Thanks so much for joining us today, Danny. Thanks for having me. I've enjoyed our conversation. <laughs> so I don't think livestock guardian dogs like mine, those independent working breeds that need space to roam, belong in crates. That's just me. But I can definitely see how these crates could be a game changer for other breeds that need structure and the comfort that can come from that in their home environment. And with Danny's crate plans, and maybe a craft IPA or two. You can make your dog's little space a cozy, stylish pad. All the links for Stay Good Dog Crates are in the show notes. Go check it out. And don't forget that 50% off discount code Danny gave for the first 100 customers, Launch Dash. Thanks for joining us at the Companions Collective. If you enjoyed this conversation, share it with a friend or two. If you have a moment, we'd love it if you could leave us a review or rating on your podcast platform. Until next week, tell your dog I said hi. Mm -hmm.